Welcome to today's webcast brought to you by DataVail. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director at Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled, What You Need to Know to Backup and Restore SQL Server Databases in Microsoft Azure. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, one lucky viewer today will win a $100 American Express gift card. The winner will be announced at the end of the event, so stay tuned to see if it's you. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, Andy McDermott, Principal SQL Server DBA at DataVail, and Pinal Dave, Blogger for SQL Authority. For more information on our speakers today, you can click on the arrows under their headshots. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Andy. Uh, hey everyone, yep, Andy here, and uh, like Stephen said there, we're talking about uh, backups and restore of SQL Server databases in Microsoft Azure today. Um, so that is the agenda, basically going over um, SQL Server in Azure, SQL Server database backups, and Azure storage accounts. So I work for DataVail. Uh, this is uh, our slide on, on DataVail. And uh, I'll let you read the slide, but in general, we're kind of a remote DBA sort of a, a company. And lately, we've been working with Pinal, uh, sort of a friend of the company, and then I'm proud to say that uh, we're friends as well. So that all kind of goes back to uh, these emails we were kicking around a couple months ago. And I'm going to pass it over to Pinal here. Pinal, you want to tell us about your email that we were writing back and forth when we were talking about setting up Azure servers with SQL Server? Absolutely. So thank you, Andy. Thank you, everybody, for giving me opportunity to talk to you. This is a real, real story. And while you guys read this email, I want to tell you something interesting. So what do I do for a living? Ah, that's a one-line statement I will tell you. I'm a SQL Server performance tuning expert, and that's the only thing I do. If you have a performance problem, I can fix it. But we say that I have a lot of things to learn when it is about cloud and a lot of other different technologies which Microsoft comes up with. And this is where, I, I mean, everybody has a limit of the knowledge, isn't it? So do I. So I am so happy that I have a friend whom I can rely. So I went to a customer where we had to fix SQL Server performance, but the problem was not only about SQL Server performance. It went a little bit different. There were issues. There was problems and there were questions related to Azure and you know what I was not good about the subject matter of the fact I am still learning a lot and that's where I depend on my friends like you know Andy works for DataWay and he helps them he's a principal guy there who helps people to go to migrate but he's also my personal friend and I reached out to him and said help me out Andy you know I know you fix big problem with your organization, but as a friend, can you give me some guidance when it is about Azure and backup? And trust me, when you are hearing this right now, you are might be finding like, okay, what these guys are talking about, what is this email about? But when you see the slide a little bit later on, you will understand what the problem was. So I wrote this email to Andy and say, Andy, help me out with Azure and you got to help me. That's how the entire conversation started. And after that lot of things conspire inspire and that's what we are going to talk today so real world let's go to the next slide and Andy immediately answered and that's what what he said yep pretty much that's about it right so I got right back to Pinal and uh, said yes we can uh, try to figure this out together and uh, that's how we got to where we are today uh, here's Pinal's intro slide Pinal you want to introduce yourself no I, I think thank you very much I think as I said only one thing I do SQL Server performance tuning but more than that I would like to call myself friend of data well and friend of Andy like Andy helps me out and so do data well when I have trouble about fixing it so I think that's pretty much it uh, about me I think it's a more about Andy who really helped me out when I was in trouble Right. Well, it goes back and forth because uh, there's certainly a, a lot of stuff I have to learn too, and you've helped me a hundred, 
hundred times with your uh, blogging. So anyway, yep, this is me. And uh, let's just move on to what pretty much the problem that Pinal presented to uh, uh, that we need to work on. So this is a SQL Server in Azure. It's a typical Azure VM, a C drive and a D drive. And then what he found out is it had a log drive and a data drive attached. So that is hey. an okay situation. Right. But and this is what, you this is what it is. Yeah. yeah, this is what it is. So when you see this kind of drive, I mean, don't you guys think so? This is the best practices, like log on a separate drive as well as data. I mean, that's fantastic. You know, I, I see a lot of you guys, over hundreds of the people right now online. Would you guys like to just give us a little bit more advice now at this point of time? Like if you have two disks, you put one thing on a data file and another one on a log file, right? Data and log, separate drive. Total, total makes sense. So what's the problem now? Well, think about it. Think about the best practices. Write down in a chat window. Write down in a, in a conversation. Or maybe you can just write down a question answer. Go ahead and tweet about this. We want to know what are the other best practices you can follow when it is about database file placement in a SQL Server. I'll give you a moment. And I see a lot of you people thought the same thing, which I thought. And that's what it is all about in the next slide. I thought, you know what? I have a log file and backup file. Where do I go and put backup? And that was the challenge, right? And think about the temp DB. You also want to put that in a separate drive along with it. So now I have four drives and I want to put backup somewhere else. I want to put temp DB somewhere else. And those are the best practices. But when we say best practices, I want to follow those best practices. Now, here is where I was confused. I was on Azure. I had a log file and data file, but do I have enough drives where I can put my backup and temp DB? Okay, some of you also said that I should put my indexes on a separate drive. Absolutely, that's also one of the best practices, but today I was only concerned about backup because I wanted to do that, and is it a good idea to put backup on a separate drive? Absolutely, but if I put backup on a separate drive, where would I put MDB? Where would I put my indexes? Where would I put my some of the page file of Windows OS? My God, that is a problem if you look at it because drives are limited. And I have a lot of things to put at separate place. How do I address them? And that's what I asked Andy, and that's where I was confused. What should I do? Help me out, Andy. And that's the question all about email. Do you guys have any suggestion where should I back up? Write it down in the chat window. Meanwhile, I would let Andy tell us what should I do in this scenario. Right. Cool. Okay. So thanks. Right. That is where it stands now. But since we are in an Azure environment here, we have a couple of different options, right? So the first question we need to ask is to take a step back from from this virtual machine, this RDP session we're looking at here, and figure out what size of Azure VM this is. So there's a good chance, in my case at least, and maybe in yours too, that you don't have access or very ready access to the actual Azure subscription to see what's really going on up there. Right? You might only have this RDP console to take a look at this machine. So you have to kind of play this game, right? No no subscription RDP only game. And if you play that game and you want to know what size this thing is, there's a couple hints you can find out just from looking at the RDP session to figure out what size of virtual machine this is. So if you look at the CPU count and how much RAM the server has, right, you can see that in, uh, in uh, SSMS uh, and the properties there. And you look at what size that tempdb storage is, that tempdb drive, the D drive, That'll give you kind of a fingerprint, right, of, of this server. And you can take that back to this website that Microsoft gives us. It's kind of a menu of all the different Azure VM sizes. So it's not perfect, but you can get a pretty good idea if you have four CPU, uh, 14 gig of RAM, and a 28 gig uh, D drive, that temp drive. You can make a pretty good guess that this is a standard uh, DS3 V2, right? So that's cool. That gives us the size. Now we know what size that is, and we know the CPU, but we already knew that. We knew the, we know the RAM. We already knew that. 
But there's a couple numbers here that really are important to us when figuring this stuff out. And this is the first one. That's 192 megabytes per second. So keep that in mind. We'll come back around to that in a few minutes. And the other one here is how many disks you can attach to this virtual machine, right? You can attach eight disks to this DS3. So like I said, keep all that in mind because we're going to figure out what to do with those eight disks in a few minutes. So here we have that situation he was in, and we do have those eight disks. So you could think that, well, let's just start attaching disks. You could go right here to where we were before, where we started up, where Pinal was looking at this original server. Let's just make another disk and put backups there. But now, since we're in SQL 2014 or SQL 2016, we have this other option, which is backups to URL. So I'll try to show you that now in the demo. Right, so before we go to backup to URL, um, just I want to understand what you just said, Andy. And I think what you just said is that we have more drives available and I can just take backup on that. Is that correct? Yeah, you can. Or are you just... A drive. Yeah, so what, that is a good idea to do, but I think you are showing me something more than that. So let me just see this demo and understand what you trying to present. I think back up to URL, we all know what that is, but I think maybe I'll understand and I will repeat my question and after you are done with the demonstration that where should I put my backup? Is backup to URL right thing or not? But let's wait for that. Let me just see what you are going to present first. Okay, sure. So here we have a backup straight to the C drive, as if you know you set up the, your SQL Server and you kind of left the defaults in and you just took this backup right to the C drive. So that happened in about five seconds. This is that uh, Worldwide Importers sample database. It's about three gig. So let's create this credential, and we're going to show you how that works in a few minutes, but for now, just... Bear with me. And then we're going to use that credential to back this thing up to URL. So that happened in a little less time, four seconds instead of five. And now it's not sitting there on our local machine. And that's the end of that demo. Hold on. Hold on. So can you just, okay, so there are two things which I just noticed. First is you took it on a C drive, and it has a different time. It took a little longer time to take backup, but when I took backup to the URL on this something called SQL storage, it is much more faster, and, um, and it seems like good. So is this the way I should be going? Or, I mean, so there are two things I just learned in this demo. One, I took a backup on a local disk, which was good, which is what I was thinking so far. But this is backup to URL, where there is a special URL I see over here, and you took a backup, and it's faster. So maybe my question would be, can you explain what you just did with this URL? Maybe this second option looks more interesting to me now. Right. There's all kinds of advantages of using the backup to URL instead of putting it to disk, right? And I can talk about that in a few minutes. But sure. first, let me show you how to build the URL string so we can uh, send that up there. Get out of the demo here. Okay, so here we go. What we just do, we sent that back up from our SQL Server and up into the cloud, up into Azure Storage. So that's where you're going to have to, again, ask your Azure guy or your cloud admin to build you one of these accounts. Just tell them you need a Azure Storage account for your backups. And then tell them you need that storage account name and the access key for that. So once you have all these things, the storage account name and the access key, you can basically get into this thing and do whatever you need to do, right? But uh, just as important as that, we need to know where we're going. So we're going to use the storage account name uh, to build this URL string right here. And that's our first part of building the URL string where we can send our backups. Like I said, once you have the storage account name and the access key, you can use a tool like um, Microsoft uh, Azure Storage Explorer. You can go in there and build your own containers, right? 
these containers are like uh, subdirectories or that are going to hold your backups for each in instance. So I just name them the instance name, and then I can complete building my URL string, URL string to send my backups. So you need the storage account name and that container name and the access key. And then finally, you can take this all back to SQL Server and build the credential like you saw in the demo there, right? So this credential, you can name it whatever you like, uh, credential name. The identity in this credential is going to be the storage account name that we just looked at, and the password will be the storage account key. So now you can start building the whole backup to URL key SQL statement. The to URL is going to be that entire URL we just built, and then that uh, key with phrase there, with credential, is the credential that you created. So once you have all those pieces, you can send those backups off to Azure Storage. And what does that give you? That gives you this opportunity to forget about having a local backup drive. You don't necessarily need it anymore, and there might be a better place to put it. In fact, I have good ideas, better places to, to better things to do with that drive. Right. So and what I just learned from you is that I should not be using my back my drive to take a backup, but instead the way you explain I should create a URL string which is an Azure storage and store my backup there so all the disks which you are displaying right now I can use it for something else. That's correct, yeah. This is good. We, see, I didn't think about it. Did I ask honestly? You know, this is what we really we did. I mean, like you explained me that I should be using backup to the URL, and that's what we end up doing. Now I have so much disk I have, so I can do a lot of things with this disk, right? What do you think I should be doing with this disk? Um, ah, I see a lot of people already answering this question. Well, good. So I can do a lot of things with this, and I think I can increase the size of the log. I can have more data, or I can store now way more data over here instead of 512. Maybe I can make it one gig of my data, and oh man, I can do a lot of things. I can create partitioning. I can I can take and do. Um, different different things uh, with this particular one so yeah absolutely it looks uh, amazing and I, I I think I think I can do a lot I should not be taking backup on disk but rather I should be using storage that's a fantastic thing but is it like perfect scenario or is that plus and minus what do you think Andy yeah it's all a good idea and you can use those disks for whatever uh, but before we get too far into figuring out where we're going to use them there's more we can find out about them, right? Just like we played sort of RDP-only game earlier where we figured out what size this Azure Virtual Machine is by just looking at a few little fingerprint kind of things on the operating system. You can also do the same for these disks, right? If you look at storage on this Azure VM, you can see here we have a couple few of these 512 gig uh, disks, right? Well, I know that that means in Azure, right? In, in Azure, that means a P20. And what's a P20? Well, P20 is a premium disk. It's uh, 512 gigs. It's got 2,300 IOPS and 150 megabits per second throughput. There's a P10. It's a little smaller. P30. It's a little bigger, more expensive. What's cool about these? You you pay for the capacity, and it's a uh, dedicated I/O just for you. So once you know that, the one key thing you can do with this is stack these guys up, right? So you're going to double the I.O. and double the megabits per second and double the size by striping these in uh, your storage as a storage pool. And that's pretty cool for backups because the thing about backing up to you all is the throughput limitation, the bottleneck, is not going to be on the URL side, on your Azure short storage side. It's going to be back here on your disks. So if you have... 300 megabytes per second throughput for one of these or for a for a doubled up uh, disk here, then you're going to get that kind of throughput sending it out. If you only have 150 megabits per second throughput for one of these disks, then that's going to be the limit of how fast you can get your backups out there. So that's a super great thing to do with these with your extra disks is start stacking these things up, and that applies pretty well except that you have to go back to that number we looked at earlier the 192 
throughput threshold, right, for this virtual, Osmond virtual size, we can't exceed that. It's like the speed of light for this for this particular instance, right? So if you, if you just have one, one P20, you're on 150 megabits per second through, throughput, but you're leaving that little bit of performance kind of on the table, right? If you go two, then you've exceeded it, but at least you're getting your money's worth out of this thing. If you go three, then you're well beyond it. You're getting lots of IOPS and, good, and a lot of storage out of it, but you'll never get more than that 192 uh, throughput threshold. So that's about it for backups to URL, part one anyway. Uh, you need that Azure storage account, the credential, and those are and the access key. Once you have those three things, you have a pretty much open door into your storage account. And you need uh, SQL Server, that should be 2012, uh, Service Pack 1, CU2, your credential. So there's pros and cons about this, and you can kind of read through this slide. But one major con is, you, is these backups we're going to take, the blobs, the blob files we're going to put up in Azure Storage are limited to one terabyte. That one terabyte limit might not be a big deal, but you saw how we just stacked the disks up to get more capacity. So obviously we could have a bigger database than one terabyte uh, on our VM. Now if we need to back that thing up, we're kind of stuck because we can't take a full database uh, or full backup of over a gig, or sorry, over a terabyte. So this seems like the scenario, right? Uh, this seems like a scenario where we are playing like game like Age of Empire, right? Like one time we find some kind of resources for the wood, then we run out of the stone and we find a stone, we run out of the silver and we find the silver, we run out of the gold. So we find a space, now we have a problem of a bandwidth and we find a bandwidth, then there is not enough um, um, a storage capacity. And it's like, a, which one we will fix? Like it's like, it seems like a problem. So I think backup and URL looks amazing, but I think there is a limitation which little bit throws me off, so I'm sure there should be some better way. Uh, don't you think so that, that there should be some way we can overcome this limitation of the bandwidth? Because, you know, bandwidth is everything, and if we are going to be throttled in this solution, like, you know, first of all, I thought taking a backup on a disk is an amazing thing, but then we thought, oh, backup and URL is a faster, looks amazing. Now we are talking about there is an issue with uh, uh, throughput, and how, how, how do we overcome this? What, what's the way to fix this scenario, or is there anything better we can do? Yeah, and the next thing you want to look at is how to stripe those, right? And this way we can break up our our multi-terabyte database into a couple different or several different database files of sub-terabyte uh, size so we can push uh, still move these up into Azure Storage. So I think, Pinal, you have a pretty good explanation about how the Stripe backup works. Yeah, so this is very, very interesting, you know. Uh, when I see the Stripe backup, uh, I think we just, um, uh, Andy had explained me earlier, and when I see the uh, Stripe backup, I was very, very excited. Okay, how many of you remember about the older floppy drive, which was of the size of 100, um, uh, one G, a little bit over 1 GB, right? If you remember, some of them 1.4 GB, oh, sorry, GB is too big word, it was MB, 1.4 MB floppy drive as well as 1.2 MB floppy drive. And if we ever receive a program or any kind of attachment or any kind of file which is bigger than 1.4 MB, what did we do at the time? There was a product which was called zipping, like, that is the, like unzipping, uh, which was, yes, 1.4, that's correct. A couple of people already wrote about that. Yeah, so that's a, that's a floppy. If we have a file which is bigger than 1.4 MB, what w used to happen? Well, we use this cutter, which is file cutter or some kind of app cutter or exe cutter, which we cut that particular uh, file into multiple files and put it on different, different disk. We put them in a different disk and give it to the person, the receiver or our friend. He takes all these disks with them and then copy them back on a one single place and joins them back. That's the same thing. If you have something very, very big, you can just cut them in a multiple parallel part, something which we used to do in earlier time with 
floppy drive is what we are going to do with this backup to the local drive so we took a backup now we went from that particular backup to taking backup on a url because of sql azure storage so now i freed up some of my drive but then there was this problem where we have to balance bandwidth with storage and everything and that particular time the new solution new workaround of backup to the local drive come up and now we are going to separate this backup out so one backup file now divided into multiple file now it does amazing thing which we are going to see in a demonstration next but you will notice that we will overcome the limitation of bandwidth along with how fast we can take backup and now our backup is easier to take because it's in a multiple chunk and in parallel let's see the demonstration of this particular scenario all right that's me again so i think here in a minute the demo screen should come up Sorry, everyone. I'm trying to get the demo started here. Hmm. Not sure why it's not. There it goes. All right. Sorry for the wait. Okay, so we're going to take this striped backup. Uh, as Pinal was saying, we can improve the throughput here because it's going on four different threads. And also, we're going to break it up. Like uh, obviously, this is this database is not uh, even close to a terabyte, but you get the idea here that we're going to split it up into four chunks of smaller size, quarter quarters. So we took that local, and that's a little wrinkle here about backups to URL. You can't take a striped backup to the URL, at least not at this point. We're still in 2000, uh, SQL 2014 land. So what you can do here and to get around that is to use this cool tool, AZ Copy, and we can copy that up to our same storage account. We're actually going to use the exact same stuff we already talked about, uh, the, that storage key we looked at and the storage account name. The same things we talked about earlier when we built it, and I'll just use uh, XP command shell to copy that up. Goes pretty quick. Move those four files right up into that same storage that where we sent our our backup to URL. Just in case you don't believe me, you can run this guy. Show that it's up there. There's one little problem here when it copies up. It copies it up <clears throat> excuse me with a different sector size when it lands up there in the Azure storage account so when you do go to restore it you need to specify the block size now you can see that's up there so that's one way around this problem like we still want to take our striped backups but we can't take them directly to URL so we can use this copy tool to push them up there Let me get back out of the demo here, if I can find my mouse again. So, right, back up to the lo local drive, uh, striped back up to the local drive. Uh, you need the same kind of stuff we needed before, the storage account, container name, and the access key, SQL version. You could do this with any version, right, taking it local and using AZ, AZ copy to push it up there. And uh, then you can strip, strip what you need and bring it back down if you need to restore it. The con here is that it's kind of a pain in the neck, right? We're doing this double double uh, hop thing. We gotta take it back up locally and then move them up, and then how do you work out the retention days and etc. So it gets complicated quick. So once we get up into SQL 2016, they give us this availability sort of like put these together, right? Now you can stripe backups, so you can get a multiple terabyte backup striped into chunks, 
and you can send all that up into the cloud via URL backups. But before we can do that, we need to take care of this security problem, really, but this kind of old style, the way they did it, the way that we could get access to those storage accounts is through the account name and the storage account key, right? We talked about that for the credential, for AZ copy, and for creating the containers. But that's not really good enough. So when they, uh, as a security piece, right? Because if anybody who has that key can get in there. So Microsoft, when they came up with 2016, SQL 2016, they kind of added this new way, right? This new credential, it's called a stored access signature. It's going to give us an extra layer, or a, an extra bit of security, and it's going to, that's going to be the key piece that's going to let us do Stripe backups to URL. And this I can hand back to Pinal because he's pretty good at explaining this. Take it away, Pinal. Absolutely. See, this is a very, very fantastic thing. So, Andy, when you had explained me this particular thing, I was so excited. I was so delighted because security is always the premier concern. Think about there are two things which is very, very important for any application. First application is, uh, for us, is performance. Well, that's what it is. Uh, performance is good, but more than performance, we do not want to compromise on our data. We do not want to lose our data. And for explaining what shared access signature is, I have to take you to very interesting, very quick journey. And I would, I'm very, very sure that you will appreciate what we are going to see next. So think about this way. Like if you are a guy walking on a street and a bad guy, a thug comes to you and said, give me your phone. But now those guys are also very smart and they will tell you, okay, give me also your password. And now what are you going to worry? You are going to worry about your phone. You are going to worry about your data. You are like, what is going to happen? Because my phone has all the important things we need. And this is where the two sides of this scenario, a bad guy ever ask you to give your phone, you aren't going to get worried about it and like what I'm going to do. And scenarios are this, like if it was year 2006, what would happen? And if it was today's year, what would happen? I want you guys to tell me this thing. So think about it, write it down in a chat window or in, in, the, in, in your question window, you feel free to write it. We are here to read I want to hear what you guys are saying. So what would happen if it was year 2006 and somebody takes your phone with your some kind of logging information and if it was here today, what would happen? Well, I see a lot of good answer already people participating. So let me just repeat one of the answers. So yes, I already know what you're going to say. That's why I had created this kind of scenario. So so far we were using either pattern or pin code. So anybody can take our pattern and pin code and they can just enter them and get access to our data. And this is what would happen. You know, if somebody says, if the cop comes and says, what happened to you? Well, my phone is compromised, my data is stolen. But if it is now today's scenario, I think it would be very, very different. Now, because we use something called fingerprint where we do not give our username and password all the time, our product is just smart enough to figure it out based on our own fingerprint. And here, I want to take a second, a one minute break from our normal flow and tell you a very interesting story, which I have read it and with photographs and I'm, uh, it was a true story. So here it is. One of the guy was, took somebody's phone and he figured it out that that particular phone can be only unlocked by putting finger on the fingerprint reader. So that particular guy keep on putting his own finger on that particular place and he couldn't still unlock the phone because his fingerprint would not match with the original fingerprint of the owner of the phone. And do you know what happened? The owner was smart. He had configured his own phone in a such a way that when anybody else puts finger on it, it will take a photo of that particular camera of that particular fingerprint and put it in a drop box which was associated uh, on that particular phone. And when he figured it out, the fingerprint, he submitted to the cops, Cops ran the fingerprint and was able to catch this guy. 
beautiful story and that tells about our security nowadays it's much more smarter than just username and password and if this particular scenario would have happened today we could have just said if somebody takes our phone you know what is not gonna to unlock it you know it just becomes brick because the guy does not have access to username password Microsoft has also come up with a beautiful thing about security in Azure it's no more just username password it's a shared access so no normal user, normal developer or the guy who come across configuring your system, taking backup, they would not see this particular username and password again and again. Instead of that, they will see some large shared access key and which they cannot copy easily or cannot just read and memorize and anything. And that's beautiful. That's what I am so happy with that. And let's understand how the shared access keys are done and for that, Andy and I had to break our head for a week. What you are going to see today in one hour actually took one or one week for us to prepare because we were working at a live customer. Matter of the fact, I was a face to the customer and Andy was behind the scene helping me out in my scenario. So Andy, I want you to tell me how did we solve this create credential problem because we walked into the very big bottleneck and with the Microsoft's help and with PowerShell, we solved this particular shared access signature so now you guys know what is shared access signature let's see how we can use this shared access signature to enhance our security of our own backup <laughs> that's right it did take us a while to get through this I probably slowed you down but uh, right so now once you have this idea behind the uh, shared access signature kind of a fingerprint right that authenticates you to the storage account um, that's the next piece we need to to build up Stripe Backups URL in 2016. So the trick of it is that we couldn't build it in uh, Azure uh, up in the Azure subscription, right, through the, the portal, right? You had to, to use PowerShell here. So Microsoft actually gives us the PowerShell script to make it way easier than uh, we were making it on ourselves. If you follow that link, you can find the whole article on it. But basically, uh, you're going to need your Azure, Azure subscription or somebody who has access to your Azure subscription. Run this PowerShell script that they give you and input a couple of variables, and it spits out the actual uh, T-SQL to create the credential. So it makes it pretty simple. Once you do have that information, you make a note of it or whatnot, take it back to a SQL Server, and now we're going to build this kind of like a new credential, right? It's a little bit different than our old one. It's a 2016 credential, I guess you could call it, and uses this shared access signature. So instead of the credential name being just whatever you want, now it's going to be the URL, same kind of URL we already built, a storage account name, a container name. Uh, in the identity field here, it's going to actually say shared access signature. So it's a little key phrase there so that uh, SQL Server knows exactly what this credential is all about. And then the password, of course, is going to be shared access signature that uh, the uh, that PowerShell script spits out of this. So now, finally, through all that, we have this opportunity. We can take Stripe backups directly to URL. And now I will try to show you that. Great, so we are going to see now the Stripe backup with a shared access key, and it's a very powerful demo. So please, guy, pay attention to what we are going to see now. Correct. Okay. So here's our old credential, the one we used earlier, right, when we did our first backup to URL. If we try to do that with the Stripe, we can see that the use of the URL device let me do a single device, right? So the big key with SQL 2016 is it lets us use blob or sorry block blob storage rather than page blob storage and I could probably do a whole presentation on that someday but that's the key to this whole thing this is trying to look at uh, page blobs right once we create our new credential here with our SS, SAS key We can back these up, and they're going to back up as a Stripe backup to block blobs. And that gives us this opportunity to have a little better throughput, but probably more importantly, uh, 
potential to break up a terabyte database into smaller files, right? So we can actually start backing up uh, databases that are bigger than one terabyte. By this demonstration, we achieved two things. Like first, we got a better throughput, and along with that, we are able to take um, larger database backup, which we were not able to take it. So it seems like with the help of shared access signature, where we take Stripe backup, it just gives us win-win situation because larger file backup, it's a more secure and it gives you better throughput. So question is that if you are taking backup any other way on Azure, why would you not do this thing? I am so confident that not all of you are aware of this particular thing. Matter of the fact, till Andy explained me that in DataWell they are using this particular practice, I was also not aware of it. Now I go back and tell a lot of friends and people and they were like, wow, we never thought about this thing. And, you know, I don't tell them that I learn from DataWell all the time, and they pat my back, and I'm happy with it. But now it is, uh, it is recorded in this webcast, so I guess the world knows that where actually I learn all this cool trick to impress people. So, yeah, thank you, Andy. And over to you. Yep, that's about right. So we went from uh, direct backup URL to one file, four files. Like I was saying in the demo there, it gives us an opportunity to break it up and uh, now we're running into a different little limitation, right? Those block blobs, those can also only be a certain size. So if you really did want to back up a really big database, you can get up to 1.2 terabytes by striping these into 64 stripes. So that would work, but it doesn't sound very fun to manage either. So it's a great idea. It can definitely get the job done. Uh, but it's also got its limitations, right? So to do Stripe Backups URL, you need all that same stuff, uh, plus this shared access signature, and then SQL Server 2016, the new SAS credential we built, and then your T-SQL statement. Like I was saying, the big con here, I guess, would be that it could be pretty hard to manage, right? If the bigger your database, the more stripes you have to worry about. Uh, can be done, but it's not as simple. So, so that kind of brings up the final thing we'll look at today, which is file snapshot uh, backups. So, to jump into a quick demo of that. So file snapshot is a final punchline in all the story, what we have done, but I'm being very, very honestly, when I went to my customer and we wanted to implement this file storage, before that he was just happy. He just said, I'm happy with security of database, I'm happy with the size, I'm happy with throughput, I do not want to implement the file snapshot. I seriously think that my customer should have implemented this last piece of it because it has some cool, neat advantage. And let's Let's see them. All right, great. So what we're going to do here is build another credential. And this one, I guess we don't have to build it. Hopefully it's already there. Yep. Uh, this one's going to be special, right? It's going to be the credential we use to move our data phase data files, database data files from disk storage into Azure DB storage, right? So just to simplify things, I'm going to do one more backup here. That's a backup to URL of this same database we've been kind of working with already. Here's that backup, right? Same old backup we've been using before. I just made it into one one instead of being a stripe so we can work with it easier, right? Now I'm going to restore that database and use a with move, and I'm going to move it to these URL locations. So I'm taking the database files from the backup and moving them, but not to a disk, but actually to Azure Storage. And I forgot I didn't want to run that. It does actually take a few minutes, but I think we can should not have done that, but we'll see if we can pull this off. 
I'm going to create another credential, and there's going to be a special credential where I'm going to put the snapshots, the, the, my backup snapshots. So if that door rolled back, okay. I'm going to take this file snapshot backup of this database that's data files are living in the cloud. And sorry about that. I do believe we'll have to work through this first. So while that's running, the logic here is since you're already in the cloud with your virtual machine and you're already in the cloud with your MDF and LDF, why not kind of get rid of the middleman there, get rid of that disk and all that, you know, complications of the backups we've been working with the whole time. Instead, you can just move your data files off a disk into Azure storage. And once you do that, once those files are sitting in blob storage, you can take advantage of Azure blob snapshots, right? The snapshots are just going to run directly against your MDF and LDF. It's a copy on write snapshot uh, time by time. So any snapshot you want is going to be sitting there from a particular time. And the backups, the SQL backups, are actually just pointers to those Azure Blob snapshots. When you want to restore one of those backups, the backup looks at where, what snapshot it's pointing at, and then it sort of pushes that down on top of your, uh, you know, back to your database. So I got that backup to work. Jump back to the demo here really quick. So here's my snapshot backup. It was less than a second, and actually no data movement took place, right? So it's amazingly quick because it's just a snapshot. You want to restore that thing, do a file list only here. And you can see that the physical name of the files is actually these URLs. It's up in the cloud. So can you just explain me how come that speed is 0.00? .00? So it's just like one... How, how did that speed is so fast or so slow? What, was, what, what made this thing that way? So it's just a snapshot. It was not really any data. It's just differential, correct? Correct. There's no data moving around. There's no throughput to be had. It's just a snapshot of the existing state of the database. So that's very cool, and I think if somebody does that, so it has all the advantage which we have talked earlier, and on the top of it, it's not a real data movement, it's just a one more step, and it just adds a little cool feature how you take backup, how you manage it, and how you can do a lot of things. So yeah, it's definitely cool, and if any of the user has not tried it out, I think they should uh, definitely try this out and reach out to DataVail or us, any of us, and see how we can help you out to do this kind of movement on your backup on Azure. So yeah, please continue. Yep. Yeah. So to kind of wrap up that end, you, you need an Azure storage account, same stuff, storage key and, and shared access signature, of course. This is 2000, SQL 2016. There's you know a number of caveats here and limitations with this thing. 100 backup uh, limits. Um, it's not very, not very good as a DR sort of option, you'd still need to sort of copy those database files and all the blob snapshots are all living in the same storage unit there, I guess, if you will, so you need to copy those off somewhere. So there's a lot of things to think about if you ever wanted to put this together, but it's pretty neat and it sure is some super fast backups for, you know, as big of a, a big a database as you could ever want. And that's about that. That pretty much brings us to the end of our presentation. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, it's a fun journey. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So uh, all of our viewers, you'll see a quick survey pop up on your screen. Please kindly take a few seconds to fill that out. And while you do, we're going to dive into questions from our attendees today. And the first question is, and Andy, Pinal, feel free, uh, whoever would like to answer, if you would both like to weigh in, what is your biggest worry when you are migrating your databases to the cloud? Right. Um, I think this is very good. 
uh, I'll let Andy answer it, but um, in my only one worry is about performance uh, because a lot of people, they move to the cloud and they suddenly cry for the performance because they do not understand how to optimally set up the set, uh, disk, how to use various things. Like me, right? I, I was the one guy who didn't know I moved things on a cloud and was thinking about taking backup on a drive till Andy came and helped me out and I was like, oh my God, I can use this drive for something else and now suddenly I can use them for backup performance. Now, not, not everybody knows this kind of things and that's what those are the challenge. So those were the challenges. Like we need to understand that what are the various offering, what else we can do and how we can, we can maximize the various um, uh, drives, uh, very various tools, various resources on our Azure. What do you want to say that, to that, Andy? Yeah, I agree. Like, I guess the challenge that, you know, I've seen is kind of the provisioning piece, like how big, what size does this virtual machine need to be when I'm going to migrate something to it? What size should I pick and how big should the disks be and, and how many should I have? So all these things, you know, play into even the migration techniques that you're going to mirror from your on-premise to Azure. You need to make sure that the uh, caliber of the Azure machine is fast enough that it can kind of handle the mirroring session to be uh, so you don't have latency back on your production side before you do before you even do the migration that's that's my take on that understood thank you Andy and uh, Pinal on to our next question uh, how do you overcome the problem of latency in the cloud Wow, that's a deep one. I mean, um, that's a tough question, man. Uh, I think whoever asked, I think you must be facing this particular problem. You know what? Latency is going to be there because that's not in our control. So now we have to think, I, I think you use the word overcome. I think that's a fair. We cannot remove the latency if it is or due to the networking issue. But we can do other things like we can think about how to place data, where to put data, what kind of DMVs are you are using uh, to figure it out where the resource bottleneck is, what are the various setup related to your indexes, and as well as what kind of data access pattern is there, how can we track slowness in the query, we can figure it out if you need more provision of the CPU, are you being throttled with CPU? I mean, there are so many things when to look up on a cloud um, when we are on Azure, but when we are on a local drive, sometimes latency is not an issue and we focus on other things, but I think the same things are also applicable when we are on a cloud and some are, sometimes we think it's a latency, sometimes we think it's because of the network, sometimes we think our system is somewhere far and we try to do this kind of thing, um, but honestly, honestly, latency cannot be get rid of so easily, you just have to focus on other factor, so the effect of latency is offset or nullified by uh, doing the right thing so after the latency whatever is happening if you improve the performance of that I think you will be satisfied and I think ultimately faster network and when you're using Azure and if you use the right geolocation I think you can overcome a lot of things uh, what do you think Andy <laughs> yeah I agree it's a good answer uh, you know from our perspective what we're looking at is, uh, is, is the disk speed so so I would kind of focus in on that you know like uh, the backups we just talked about. The faster the the faster you can get your the disks where the data and log files live, the faster your backup's going to be. So that, of course, plays into latency overall and, per, and performance overall. Understood. On to our next question: What are the top reasons for a slow performing cloud database? I think I mean it's kind of along the same lines. Like I would say, the number one thing I'd look at is the is the disk setup. Say you have there's um, you know two different types of disk. You have premium, which we kind of looked at, and then there's standard, right? Standard's super cheap. You only pay for what you use. It comes in these big sizes, but it's shared storage, so you might not always get uh, full full performance capacity out of it if it's getting shared with somebody else. And it you know, caps out at uh, 60 megs per second. I think it's a hundred, um, I think it's a hundred IOPS. So if you look at your SQL server, a lot of the same on-prem stuff that you do for sort of performance evaluation is going to apply. But then when you get down to that disk level, 
you can actually see what's going on. You can kind of make decisions and infer like why there's a performance problem by just looking at the disks. You might not have that opportunity for an on-premise box, you know, if it's a SAN or something, maybe somebody else is administering the whole storage piece. But when you're in Azure, at least you can you can see what's going on. And, and uh, if it is, uh, you know, the IO latency is your performance prop problem, then you can start at least making having ideas of of what to do next, you know, move from standard storage to premium storage and or double up your disks in a stripe. So that's that's uh one way to get away get, to improve your performance in the cloud for SQL Server. Understood. Uh Pinal, would you like to weigh in on that question as well? I think Envy said all so yeah, that's fine. I think uh I think we are pretty covered with that answer so I would be just repeating my friend. Understood. On to our next question. What is uh, What are the best practices for disaster recovery and high availability on cloud with SQL Server? I uh, realize that's a uh, broad question, but uh, top of mind for one of our attendees today. Um, you know, like you can get away with a lot of the same stuff that, that you do on I mean, it is. It's a wide open question. So, in my experience, use a lot of always on availability groups, uh, trying to work that out. Um, it's got to be enterprise edition. So, if you're not using that, then then you're back to backups and uh, um, you know, I guess what else? Backups, replication, log shipping, if you like, mirroring uh, to a certain degree depending on your version. So, wide open question, I guess. I have a lot of ideas on it, but I'm not sure where to go with it. Uh, if you can email me if you want and talk about it. Understood. We could probably have a whole webinar just on that. <laughs> That's true. And also a lot of things which we think, I think Andy is very, very right. Like we were talking about it. There is no right or wrong answer once you go on a cloud because, you know, we hear, always hear the infrastructure is being maintained. Infrastructure is already being taken care of. Something we don't have to worry about it. And now we can still use the, uh, and, and, and during the, our course of the time, we understood like how to use mirroring, how to use replication. Those, even though they are high availability solution, we start learning that we can do more than that. Like we do the replication in one way to have our hot backup, but secondary we are also reading from that particular data for some reporting purpose and things. So we become a very, very creative, right? We are very creative people. Humans are like evolving. They are creative. And because we are using HA and DR solution to more than what they are already, I think this entire answers become very, very complicated. Maybe one of the future topic, as you said, we can talk about like how to do DR and HA creatively on cloud, and we can talk about like how we can use them for multiple different things. Fantastic idea, you got, you the, I think the user gave us. Um, uh, thank you, thank you for asking this. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you, Pinal. That is actually all the time we have for questions today. We apologize uh, that we were unable to get to all of your questions, but as I stated earlier, all questions will be answered via email. I'd like to thank our speakers today, Andy McDermott, Principal SQL Server DBA at Datavail, and Pinal Dave, Blogger for SQL Authority. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived and you'll receive an email once the archive is posted. Plus, if you would like a PDF of the presentation, you can click on the resource icon at the bottom of your console once the event is archived. Now, as we stated earlier, just for participating in today's event, someone would win a $100 American Express gift card. And the winner today is Wallace Wong. Wallace, we will be in touch via email so you can claim your prize. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.